Adam Peter Rieger from the University of New Mexico, Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. Continuing on, um, I believe, building on David's yeah. information. His title is Water Quality Impacts of Runoff from Monsoon Storms of the Rio Grande. Hey everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm going to build off of some of what Dave was talking about. Uh, today I'm going to be focused on stormwater quality. Uh, we're interested in when things run off of urban landscapes versus non-urban landscapes. Um, what are the differences? What does that mean for downstream? That's kind of what I'm focusing on today. Uh, so the motivation for this study, we're following up on some really interesting work from uh, Julia Wise. She worked at UNM uh, and she collected a lot of DOC or dissolved organic carbon samples coming through the North Diversion Channel. So it's draining off of the Albuquerque urban landscape. Uh, and she was looking at how do concentrations change? How does DOC quality change? Um, we have two storms here. So we've got these nice black dots. Those are your concentration. That's the amount of carbon coming through in each of these storms. You can see it's pretty clear it increases during the storm pulse. But we also have this FI, which is the fluorescence index. Um, and that basically is just a general indication of the quality of the DOM. So we can actually tell we have this consistent pattern through each of these storms. And that's a transition between microbial and terrestrial sources. Um, and DOM or DOC fuels microbial activity. Uh, the quality of the DOC actually controls that or limits that. Um, and we know microbial activity, especially heterotrophic activity, that can consume oxygen. So one of our questions was, does this carbon that's being mobilized off of the urban landscape, does that affect or drive oxygen demand? Uh, so, they did a really nice job of highlighting some of this high frequency data we have. I want to just really drill that point home. Uh, so, for anyone that goes out in the field, you grab a sample, uh, you take it back to the lab. It takes a lot of effort. Um, so, if you're going out there and you're collecting a sample every eight hours, this is an event that um, you'll see, yes, it is a DOSAG. But right now, if you collect a sample every eight hours, you don't really see that. If you were to go out and you're in an ISCO and it was running every two hours, still really energy intensive. You have to go out and collect the samples. You have to filter them. You can start to see there's a DO sag. If you do one hour, which would be really intensive, your ISCO only lasts a day. Uh, you start to see there's some shape. Um, you can kind of tell how fast the DO sag occurs. Um, but we're collecting 15 minute data. So we're actually able to see that the sag is a lot lower. Um, we're able to see the shape of how that DO sag occurs when it comes on, how it kind of flushes through the system. So that kind of just highlights uh, the importance of this high resolution data. Um, so our goal is to use sensors to capture rapid water quality changes in the middle of Rio Grande. Uh, just to place things so everyone's familiar with the system. Uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about Alameda today. I've got a little bit of data from US 550, a little bit from Kochi, and a little bit from Rio Bravo. Uh, and then again, we have this really nice long-term record. I'm only talking about the 2018 monsoon season, so literally like June to October, just a tiny blip of this time series we have. Uh, in terms of sensors, Dave already mentioned, we use YSI XO2s or XO1s. Uh, all of the sites on that map on the previous slide, they've got temperature, conductivity, oxygen, pH, and turbidity. Uh, I'm a carbon biogeochemist by trade. So for me, my, my baby is the fluorescent dissolved organic matter probe or FDOM. It's a mouthful, but it basically is a proxy for DOC. Uh, we also employed a Seabird Suna, it's an optical nitrate sensor. Um, it measures nitrate, it measures UV absorbance at a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, I'm sorry, I got to drag you through the corrections real quick. This will be really short. Uh, for FDOM, it's an optical measurement, so fluorescence is affected by temperature quenching. Uh, it's affected by suspended solids through scattering, dissolved solids through absorbance. We did correct for temperature and turbidity. Turbidity obviously is a huge issue in our system. Uh, we didn't do an absorbance correction. The sooner really hates turbidity, so we didn't really get good absorbance data. Um, but I'd like to highlight some of these data that we corrected. The values are 40% higher than the uncorrected data. So it's really, really important for these kinds of measurements to, to make sure we correct. Um, so for the REACH, trying to distinguish our urban and non-urban inputs. Everyone here knows this is a really complex system. There's a lot of gauge stuff, a lot of ungauged stuff. Uh, base flow is controlled by CoachD. We have the HAMES, which is a clear non-urban input. That's gauged, but there's a lot of ephemeral channels that are ungauged. Uh, same thing for urban. We've got the North Diversion Channel feeding in above Alameda. That's gauged. There's a lot of other gauged and ungauged inputs. Um, so we've got a lot of complex sources, and these complex sources are mixing. 
so the question is, how do we distinguish runoff from primarily urban or primarily non-urban catchments? Um, so this is an example of some of the data we've got from specific connectivity. Found to be a really nice proxy for a runoff source. So as an example of the urban storm over here in the nice purple color, uh, starting at the top at Cochiti and Burnley 550, you don't really see any sort of uh, signature for this time period. Once you get below the North Diversion Channel at Alameda, you see this really clear connectivity sag, uh, and that sag propagates down to Rio Bravo. Kind of similar for the non-urban, um, but more or less the opposite, actually. So for Cochiti, we don't see a signature. We see below the Jemez this spike coming in off of the non-urban catchment, and we see that propagate all the way downstream. Um, so to identify urban and non-urban events, we use quick flow, uh, looking through our hydrograph to identify events. We use specific connectivity to determine if it was more from an urban area or a non-urban area, and we can check that with our gauge sites. Uh, and we only use high quality sensor data. Uh, this data can be a real mess. Things get really messy as Dave showed with the songs. Uh, so we only used it when we had good signatures. Uh, so this is a whole bunch of data I'm throwing at you. We'll summarize it real quick. Uh, we ended up identifying 15 storms for the 2018 monsoon season. 10 of them were urban, five of them were non-urban. I'd like to highlight we have both physical and biogeochemical properties. Our physical properties are connectivity and temperature and turbidity. Our biogeochemical properties are DO, pH, and FCOM. Uh, just some general patterns. Temperature generally increases during these storms. Uh, we see a way bigger turbidity increase for non-urban events. It's not super surprising, but it's about 10, or 10 times the average of the urban events. For DO sags, they're a lot bigger for urban events, almost double that for the average of the non-urban events. Uh, for pH, we see this change in response through the season. Starts off as a pH spike and goes to a pH sag. We see increased FDOM for all of our urban events. And again, FDOM is a proxy for DOC. Uh, if we do a kind of back of the envelope calculation using a correlation between grab samples for DOC and FDOM, we see that estimated change is about 9.3 milligrams carbon per liter above baseline during these urban events. And again, we have limited nitrate, but we have good nitrate pulses for two of these events. Uh, and they're both really consistent increases. They looked a lot like FDOM. Uh, so looking at the water quality relationships, this is principal component analysis. Uh, if you're not familiar, basically you take a multivariate data set and you can dimensionally reduce it. Here we've chosen two components. So our first component, which is your, your x-axis, uh, explains about half of the variability in this data set. Second component explains about a quarter. If you look at your nice green dots over there, those are non-urban events. Um, you can see those separate out towards the positive PC1, our urban events separate out towards negative PC1. And if you look at our variables, we've got our physical parameters over here on the right, positive PC1. We've got our um, biogeochemical variables over here, negative uh, PC1. So those are associated with urban storms. Um, so next, we did some transfer function modeling. It's really difficult if you don't know what your sources are to track how things are moving through your system. So we selected a reach where both these urban and non-urban storms are moving through, so between Alameda and Rio Bravo. Uh, transfer function modeling is just data-driven modeling, so we don't make any assumptions about evection or dispersion. Um, and basically, we derive a relationship between the upstream site and the downstream site. That's your transfer. So the first step, we fit the function for a conservative tracer. We use specific connectivity. Um, and we fit that between Alameda and Rio Bravo. We use that function, applied it to our Alameda DO, um, SAG, and we predicted what would happen at Rio Bravo if DO traveled conservatively. Um, so for our non-urban event, we've got our model over here in red. Rio Bravo, this is our downstream site. As you can see, we underpredict this SAG, or we overpredict the SAG, sorry. So this is your model, right? Way lower than what actually happened. We have the exact opposite happening for the urban. This uh, overprediction, this is likely associated with re-aeration. Um, DO doesn't travel conservatively. Um, so it's going to gain some oxygen back as it moves between Alameda and Rio Bravo. But this huge oxygen sag compared to the minimal predicted over here for the urban event indicates oxygen demand. So just to kind of visualize that, we have mostly positive values for measured minus model for our non-urban. So again, no clear oxygen demand. For urban, we have pretty clear continued oxygen demand. Uh, and we think this is probably linked to a lot of the carbon and the nutrients that are being flushed to the landscape. They're potentially driving some of this heterotrophic activity and continuing that oxygen demand through this reach. Uh, to kind of summarize, we developed a conceptual model. So we've got our water quality parameters. The, the general parameters are summarized down here at the bottom. 
And a couple of concerns that we can think of based on what our data is saying. Uh, it seems like we've got um, increased oxygen demand with some of these urban plumes. We also have potential for nitrogen or nitrogen carbon driven um, eutrophication hypoxia and potentially the treatment costs associated with that. For our non-urban, it seems really like the super turbid water is a problem. So uh, people that work with water management here are well aware that it costs a lot of money to treat, um, to take out those sediments. Thanks. Um, and we did a quick literature review. I won't get into this because it's not super relevant to energy, but uh, over 22 studies across a really wide range of biomes, we actually found the water quality responses in the MRG are pretty similar to what other people are seeing across the country. Uh, just to briefly summarize, uh, we found connectivity to be a really nice proxy for runoff source. Um, and it can tell us a lot of information about where some of these storms are coming from in the MRG. We saw higher concentrations of carbon and nitrogen as well as higher demand associated with our urban storms. Uh, in general, it appears that the urban storms are a little more driven by biogeochemical parameters. Uh, the physical parameters link a little more to our non-urban events. Uh, and we see generally similar responses in water quality to stormwater runoff in urban areas across uh, a gradient of climate. Uh, I'd like to thank folks that were involved in this, uh, the funding sources that made it possible, and I think I have time. So the PCA is dividing our urban and our non-urban events, and across that same axis, uh, our variables are generally divided. So this isn't saying that temperature-specific uh, conductivity and turbidity are only related to the non-urban. It's just showing that a similar divide in the individual points is present in the variables. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see any effects of um yeah we see some kind of like a legacy effect maybe of things build up and then when the monsoon season hits you get these bigger flushes of carbon there's a difference in the ph response which I think it's probably related to some of the concrete, concrete infrastructure, the impervious surfaces, stuff like that. So some of those like solutes are, we see a diminished response throughout the season. We didn't really have enough non-urban events to, to tell any patterns on that though. Yeah. Can you help me again with one of your sort of general concepts is for mixing in oxygen in the water with high or low flows? So does it take longer to mix with high flows versus low to get back to whatever you want to call the baseline condition? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Uh, I would assume with higher flows, potentially more turbulence. So if you're talking about like re-aeration, potentially you'd have a higher re-aeration coefficient. I don't do a lot of oxygen modeling. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not entirely sure. It's a great question. Thank you.